name is Jan. And I will be talking to you today about computer system security. This course will cover a wide range of concepts within computer system security from a couple of different vantage points. But first, I wanted to have this sort of introductory video to get at the meaning of the term and the conceptual philosophical uh, meaning um, in which we'll be operating, right? Um, so what is computer system security? Let's deconstruct this into its constituent parts and then um, talk about it as a whole later in a uh, sort of interesting example that we'll look at. Um, let's start with the term security, right? Security is a uh, term with many meanings. It can mean different things to different people, uh, emotional security, financial security, physical security, um, et cetera, right? Um, to us, we're talking about it from the perspective of systems security. And what does system security mean? System security means the security of a system with respect to a specified um, property, right? So let's uh, take an example. Let's say we have a system that is a vending machine. This isn't necessarily a computer system. We'll get to that later. Uh, this is a system, a complex system, that has a certain um, goal, certain properties that, that should be maintained. One of these is that you should not be able to receive snacks or drinks or whatnot without putting in some um, money into the machine or without payment, right? So let's look at examples of how the security of such machines, of such systems can be compromised. Usually when uh, I teach this course in person, this is a discussion, a back and forth Q&A where we, we kind of uh, come up with attacks, come up with defenses. Uh, unfortunately, right now there's a one-way transmission, so we'll have to um, adapt and uh, I'll just blabber at you about potential compromises and so forth of a vending machine. So let's uh, start with the very simple one, one that m maybe some of us have pulled as kids when we had smaller arms. You can uh, take your, your hand, put it through the kind of um, place where, where you retrieve your drink or whatever, um, and then you know reach way up there and try to grab uh, snacks on the bottom row. Right? This is one attack that if the vending machine is designed in a naive way can succeed right and using this attack you violate the security specification of a vending machine um, in that you receive a snack without paying so how would you fix that right well, of course modern machines uh, takes several different approaches you could just have a um, some sort of a, a barrier so you couldn't reach your hand up and the barrier might you know flip uh, to let uh, um, or open to let the merchandise through when you actually pay. Um, some machines have like just a little, you know, capsule container thing that, that grabs whatever you're, you just bought and, and, and actually releases it into um, uh, wherever it needs to release so that you can grab it uh, and so forth. There, there are different um, ways to, to close this gap. Right, so then we came up with an attack against this computer system, and the designers, developers, whatnot of the computer system came up with a fix, a, a, a patch, let's say, right, to restore the security of it. Well, are we done? No, because that system is still not uh, perfectly secure. You can imagine someone coming in with a hammer breaking the glass at the front of the uh, machine and walking away with uh, the snacks or the drinks or whatnot. Again, the security of the system has been compromised. Someone was able to retrieve uh, merchandise without paying for it. Um, so then of course we can fix that as well. We can uh, put a, a steel mesh behind the glass so that uh, even with a hammer you couldn't get through. We can make the glass Hammer proof or something along these lines, right? So again, here's an, another attack that bypasses our first defense, but for which we now have a second defense, 
now is that the end of the story um you know obviously no uh you can start uh coming up with increasingly novel attacks like bringing in counterfeit uh currency and now you know this uh machine has to have a way to detect counterfeit currency trying to pay with um something that that is the shape of a quarter and the weight of a quarter or tying a string to your quarter and pulling it back these are all attacks that have been performed on real uh vending machines that uh real vending machines now have to defend against uh in order to be uh secure right and vending machines nowadays of course are more and more complex systems there are vending machines that that take credit cards this opens them up to a whole other range of attacks um there are vending machines that with which you can um uh, talk with your phone and so forth, right? So uh, the complexity of these systems is is rising and the security of these systems is more and more complicated, right? And this discussion is really meant to highlight one thing and that is that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, right? The um, story of the vending machine compromise has repeatedly been Here's a big complex system. Let's try to find one clever thing we can do, whether it's putting our arms up through um, the, the outlet um, of the merchandise or you know, figuring out that we can break it with a hammer or tying a string to a quarter and so forth. One little thing we can do that takes advantage of one part of the system, one small weakness to fully break the security, to get um, snacks or drinks or whatnot when we haven't paid, right? So with that in mind, let's move on and talk about computer systems, right? Uh, computer systems are, as we know, not secure. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be seeing the huge amount of um, data breaches and, and, and chaos that we see in the context of computer system security, and they're very complicated and uh, not super approachable. Um, they're also growing rapidly in complexity. So this graph here is a graph of the amount of code, just amount of code in the Linux kernel over the years. Um, and we see uh, over the years, just this monotonic almost growth uh, continuously and an interesting thing that we see is every year a bunch of code is added and then that code is rewritten, refactored, removed over time, but a lot of it stays around. So in the Linux kernel, even today, there's a ton of code that was added in you know, 2006. Um, it looks, you know, just based on a, on, a, on a rough look, maybe, you know, a tenth of the code in the Linux kernel is 14 years old. 14 years ago, cybersecurity was a completely different world. Um, and uh, cybersecurity practices, safe program practices were very different. So this is a um, interesting uh, influence on the security of these code bases and that there's a lot of old code, there's a lot of code that people might not understand and uh, vulnerabilities get introduced. So let's look, um, once we get through these takeaways, you know, that computer systems are complex and with these complexities you can get vulnerabilities and as we saw from the vending machine example uh, a single vulnerability can break the security of the whole system you know the the, the, the chain again is only as weak as, uh, as strong as its weakest link and if you figure out you know one place to 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 jam your uh, you know violation of security you can leverage open um, the whole system very frequently. Um, so let's look at it this as a whole. What is computer system security? From the view of an example, and the example focuses on this character. Um, this is not uh, a Muppet. I mean, uh, the, the picture is technically of a Muppet, but the character behind the Muppet, the, the individual behind the Muppet, is responsible for a very high profile um, hack that is really um, 
a perfect example of a single flaw um, or a small collection of flaws leveraging open the security of an entire company and leading to extreme real world effects. Um, a lot of this uh, is gleamed from an interview um, that this individual gave um, to uh, a reporter um, for a famous online magazine. I, I always slips my mind exactly which one. I think it might have been Wired. Um, and for real, uh, there was you, you can find this online, this interview of an actual human reporter um, uh, right there talking to right there um, a, a, a puppet uh, and the human reporter is asking questions and the puppet is uh, responding using you know voice anonymization and so forth it's super interesting to watch um, along with this this uh, hacker um, also wrote a write-up there will be links uh, to it in my slides and I highly recommend you read this for a, a example of real world, you know, um, actual systems compromise um, that is kind of not sanitized, not, it, it's just, you know, raw and, and described as is, which is super, super interesting to read. Um, so this hack was pulled off, uh, the individual's uh, hat handle is Phineas Fisher. Um, it's unclear who exactly they are. They might be, you know, multiple people. They might be an entire group. They might be one person. Um, but uh, sometime in uh, 2016, Phineas Fisher took issue with the actions of a company called Hacking Team. Uh, Hacking Team was a, an Italian company that created a number of um, hacking tools. And Phineas Fisher, uh, was um, unhappy about the clientele of Hacking Team, uh, which allegedly, uh, initially allegedly, and then eventually after this hack took place, very publicly included um, oppressive regimes and, and so on. Um, so in uh, 2016, on one sunny day in July, I'm sorry, 2015 now I see from the tweet, I, I always mix up these dates. Um, July 6, 2015, uh, hacking team changed their Twitter handle to hacked team and tweeted, you know, since we have nothing to hide, we're publishing all of our emails, files, and source code. And these files included um, audio recordings of phone calls, uh, just an enormous uh, information, uh, amount of information. It was a brutal disclosure. Um, and of course, they didn't do this willingly. Uh, Phineas Fisher compromised uh, hacking team's entire cyber infrastructure and um, disclosed all of this on the internet. So how did this happen? How uh, was the security of this computer system so thoroughly violated as to essentially uh, destroy this company? Uh, hacking team kind of ceased to exist in, in, in any large high profile capacity. Um, as a result of this, uh, they were uh, hit with a lot of scrutiny, a lot of um, criticism, controversy, and so forth because of the disclosed information, and and uh, their business, you know, suffered very heavily. Um, so let's walk through the, um, the 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 steps that Phineas Fisher took to um, hack hacking team. Um, I uh, mentioned there will be a uh, link to a write-up. Um, that's the link down at the bottom of the slides. Um, these write-ups keep getting taken down for whatever reason, so that's just kind of the latest um, version that exists uh, out there. Um, the write-up is interesting in that Phineas Fisher lays out exactly the steps that they took to um, carry out this attack. It's uh, um, super interesting and we'll follow it step by step. Uh, step one of this compromise was reconnaissance, right? So Phineas Fisher decided to attack hacking team. Um, and they, they looked into uh, what um, attack vectors are possible. Um, in the write-up, uh, they talk about the d different ways that you can get information on a company uh, by looking through um, uh, 
press releases, by downloading PDFs released by that company and looking at metadata embedded in the PDFs, by looking on LinkedIn uh, and all sorts of other uh, routes, right? But um, in the end, using mostly uh, kind of internet uh, reconnaissance, um, Phineas Fisher concluded that hacking team was actually uh, pretty good in terms of their external um, internet facing security. They had very little network facing infrastructure, mostly uh, a web server, a mail server, a VPN endpoint, and some routers, right? That's a very small digital presence. Um, they had a pretty low public profile and professional external security practice. I mean, these were professional security engineers, right? It's, it's, it's a daunting target. Um, so with this information in mind, Phineas Fisher uh, proceeded to gain a foothold in their network. That was the next step, right? So how did they do it? They looked in one of the embedded devices, routers or, or, or appliances or something. Um, Phineas Fisher doesn't specify in their write-up uh, what which exactly device, but they took this device, uh, metaphorically speaking, downloaded the um, software that runs on this device, uh, and you can do this in a number of ways from, you know, let's say if you have a Linksys router, um, you can go to Linksys's website and download a firmware update, unpack it, and there's the, the software. Um, so Phineas Fisher downloaded the software, spent a couple of weeks analyzing that software and found a zero day vulnerability previously unknown to anyone and now unknown to anyone but Phineas Fisher. So Phineas Fisher had a, you know, get into the system free card, so to say, and they used it to gain a foothold in hacking teams network. Um, after that, having gotten on the network, they performed internal reconnaissance, right? And they had the luxury of taking it slow and steady because again, the vulnerability that Phineas Fisher used to get into the network was unknown to anyone but them. It is as if you uh, wanted some snacks and you figured out a new way to contort your arm so that uh, you could get past the vending machine's uh, output blocker and get some snacks, right? So until other people catch on, uh, if no one sees you use this trick to to steal uh, snacks, you know you're kind of uh, sitting pretty on, on 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 quite a lot of stolen food for whatever reason. But uh, anyways, maybe a bad analogy, but that was the situation with uh, Phineas Fisher sitting on hacking teams network. So they had the luxury of taking it slow and steady. They did. Uh, initially passive network listening and then careful, slow, uh, active network scanning um, to identify several other um, uh, pieces of infrastructure on hacking teams network internally that were now fairly um, accessible, right? And that weren't properly secured. So again, this is where things start getting really bad, but keep in mind that this is inside their network, right? Inside their network, uh, things weren't secured from uh, people that were already inside their network. But, you know, that's, from my experience, not a very uncommon thing. So anyways, um, they found an uh, unsecured server that had audio recordings of the physical security system. So that's already pretty bad, right? Um, that was a lot of audio that ended up in that final disclosure. Um, and, and, and that's... Uh, not something that you want um, around. For, aside from a lot of confidential information getting set over the phone or whatever within earshot of your cameras, uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting techniques where by using the sound of your keyboard typing, you can recreate you know, the keys that you press, for example. Uh, recent uh, research has indicated that you can use the sound of your key going to a lock to actually synthesize a copy of the key itself, right? So this is uh, maybe theoretical sci-fi-ish attack still, but but leaking all of your audio recordings is already bad, but it gets worse, right? Um, Phineas Fisher kept looking, and one thing that they found was a badly secured backup server, which is uh, very bad because on this backup server was a backup of 
the mail server. And by analyzing the backup of the mail server, they were able to extract the credentials of the administrator of the mail server. And these credentials were still valid on the running mail server. So this is kind of a, a flaw two and three here where there was an unsecured backup server. And on that unsecured backup server was a backup that had a, a password in it that was still active, right? But when you take backups, do you remember to change all your passwords after every backup? I mean, I've never heard a policy like that, but from this perspective, that would have been a good policy. So it turns out that uh, having full control of the mail server, it'll come in useful later for Phineas Fisher, but uh, it also helped them spread out over the network because uh, they were able to um, use that mail server to gain administrative privileges over the entire Windows domain that hacking team had. Using that, they installed um, uh, a key sniffer in the um, uh, on the sorry, I'm drawing a blank on the machine of one of the um, engineers, uh, one of the administrators, and was able to catch uh, the, a password being entered by that administrator to unlock an encrypted volume containing even more passwords. Um, and then they had basically free reign inside the um, hacking team uh, administrative network, right? Or the, the, sorry, the production network. The problem is that Phineas needed access to the development network as well. Hacking team carefully segregated their networks to um, maintain some best practice separation between the uh, network that they uh, did their their development of their hacking tools with that had the source code of the hack tools, et cetera, and the network that they did for everyday business. Oops. Um, and you, bleh, using the passwords that they recovered from the encrypted volume, they were able to log into a monitoring server that had access to both networks. And using an end day, previously known but unpatched vulnerability in that monitoring server, they were able to gain complete access to uh, the development network because there were reused passwords between the development and the uh, production network, right? This is uh, more minor things that that hacking team did wrong uh, from a security perspective, uh, password reuse um, and uh, allowing an unpatched vulnerability to be present on their network. But again, this was inside their network, right? Um, and, and many companies often ignore or, or deprioritize the security posture inside the network. All right, step six, of course, uh, having compromised the development environment and gotten all the source code and so forth and so on, um, Phineas bundled it all up, uploaded it um, to the cloud and used their mail server, their control over um, the hacking team mail server to request a password reset from Twitter. Of course, they emailed that to hacking team to that mail server. Finez grabbed the link, changed the the, um, the Twitter uh, uh, details, tweeted out this uh, gloating blurb and released this data to the world, right? Um, and again, the security of hacking team from the outside before Finesse Fisher started looked pretty good, right? This was a careful company of cybersecurity professionals. And this whole security chain unraveled when Finesse Fisher found a zero day vulnerability in a device that hacking team uses, were using. Um, in some sense, that's not even hacking team's fault from a security perspective. Right, that is uh, kind of the takeaway of, of, of this story that computer system security is so difficult uh, to get right that, you know, as we can see through this and tons and tons of other disclosures, even professionals 
uh, get it wrong all the time. Um, so what went wrong as a summary, um, there's a bunch of things, uh, a couple of uh, different weak links, but for the most part, they were all minor, right? Um, the lack of two uh, factory authentication for internal um, their internal accounts. But let me ask you, do you use two factory authentication to log into your laptop? Um, password reuse. Uh, everyone I know reuses passwords to some extent. Um, even if not on the internet, then uh, oftentimes on their uh, local computer accounts. Um, I'm going from the bottom up here, but but it, it's it's a bunch of uh, different stuff, right? Um, they uh, didn't isolate their backup uh, system because po po possibly because they didn't expect passwords to get backed up, but the passwords did get backed up, um, and you know it, it goes all the way up to this zero day in the physical infrastructure or in the in the public facing network infrastructure that we discussed that's a very very hard thing to avoid i can guarantee you that most likely whatever public facing network infrastructure you are running has zero days that you're not aware of in it just because this stuff on average is very very insecure right um, in some sense all of the security infrastructure that we have built up um, is just waiting for one vulnerability to crack it all open. So the takeaway that I'm trying to, uh, to, to convey is that it's easy to, you know, think, oh, okay, well, hacking team screwed up and they got hacked. But the story of computer system security is really that the likely scenario, if that had been your company, things would not have gotten very differently. Um, all right, now we're gonna dive into a um, discussion of ethics in computer hacking, because this is a uh, course that's going to approach this problem of computer system security from an offensive perspective. I want you to understand the types at least on, on, on several very concrete um, approaches to the problem, the types of vulnerabilities that arise that compromise these entire systems, right? Um, for that, you need to be very careful about ethics. We need to make sure that uh, the knowledge we learn in this course and, and our general uh, interaction with uh, cybersecurity is uh, ethical and, and correct, right? So what are the ethics of the hacking team hack, right? Obviously, Finesse Fisher broke into a system that they were not authorized to access. Uh, that is essentially the digital equivalent, of course, of, of uh, breaking into someone's home or business. Um, Finesse Fisher, in their write-up, um, discussed that they are uh, doing this, that they pulled off that hack because hacking team was uh, unethically selling uh, software to uh, oppressive regimes. Uh, and that complicates this discussion in an interesting way. Um, but in general, as ethical computer hackers, I have to stress very thoroughly that you should not practice cybersecurity against any targets that you are not authorized to practice cybersecurity against, right? So let's get into some hacking ground rules. Rule number one is please do not do anything illegal. I mean, that should just be obvious, but uh, it needs to be stated and needs to be stressed, right? Approach cybersecurity in an ethical, careful way. What does this mean specifically? It means if you don't have explicit permission to hack a system do not hack it it's not hard that's a pretty simple thing don't hack systems you don't have access to um, in the same uh, vein uh, don't attempt to find vulnerabilities in systems that you don't own or or have permission to audit right so uh, what does that mean in practice I and mean, how do you how do you even like become a, a hacker get get good and so forth. Well, you can run a server for yourself to hack, 
right? If you're interested in finding vulnerabilities in devices, you use your own devices. Um, uh, you can stick to software and services that have bug bounties. Believe it or not, the current state of cybersecurity is that most companies, many, many companies will actually permit you to try to hack them as long as you promise um, that they'll be the first to know. A lot of companies will actually give you money for that. I'll, I'll discuss um, some of these uh, monetization opportunities in a different uh, video, most likely. Um, you can, of course, become an academic uh, like me, my colleagues, uh, researchers working, um, doing awesome work in, in my lab and, and other labs around the world. Um, and academics get some leeway. We can, we can uh, you know, do research um, that is, is very tricky to do as a non-academic research into, um, you know, for, as an example, uh, the security of digital rights management. Um, laws such as the Digital Millennium Copyright Act have exceptions for uh, research. Um, or if you really want to get a lot of awesome practice, um, you can become part of the competitive hacking community. Um, sorry, believe it or not, there are uh, active uh, competitions of computer hacking out there. Um, I run one of the, the big ones, um, and I'll also discuss that in a different video to try to get you all moving into the competitive cybersecurity world if you're interested. All right, so what are the takeaways, right? Again, very important to stress, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Uh, this is the attack defense asymmetry, right? In order to protect themselves, hacking team or any other uh, group um, that has been recently compromised or hasn't yet been compromised, um, has to block every attack. That's very hard because the attacker just has to land one, right? This is the, the typical attack defense asymmetry. Uh, good defenses fail. Hacking teams, um, external network facing infrastructure was good. It seemed secure, but it didn't save them, right? Um, and very, very, very importantly, hackers have to be careful around ethics, right? Our field is um, a very cutting edge development field with, with high impact in the modern world. Uh, we need to take that very seriously. Uh, and as you learn various ways to identify and attack security in computer systems, I'd encourage you to always uh, keep this in mind um, and always stay ethical. That's uh, all for this video. Um, there'll be a number of introductory videos to the course and of course a number of uh, you know videos where we will learn about the different topics i hope you stick with it see you later